On today's episode, it's a good old-fashioned mailbag. We're answering your questions, and we're going to get into some of the ultimate draft kit statistics. We have just recently completed our rough draft, and we talk about some players who have surprised us and where they are ranked. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, like the video, and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Tuesday, May 17th. The Fantasy Footballers back with you, Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, and the Deucers. Yeah. The three squirreliest <laughs> producers in all the land. I look back, I saw several of them deciding if they were going to jump in on the microphones, and no one no. did. No, and no, that's, no. That's fine. No, that's better. Well done. Good decision making. But it's the, so it's fellas, it's the middle of May. Very excited about football. Fully focused. Oh, yeah. It's only football around Laser here. Laser focused on the NFL. Yeah, I mean, what else football. would we be focused on? I don't know. I'm just family. I'm just reminding people that We're, we are locked in. We are a one sport team here, <laughs> and it is football. Yeah, we can't be diverted from football for other fandom. Locked in. And we're fine. We're super fine. <laughs> yeah, we're we're good, man. Nothing. I'll, I'll, none of us wearing any paraphernalia. To... <laughs> Being an Arizona sports fan sucks. Yeah, I mean, so we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> People want to hear us talk about it. Do they? Uh, yes, they look, do. The, the, they want to revel in our tears. The Suns were humiliated. It was the worst, most disappointing loss in the history of the organization because they had the best year they've ever had. It is a disappointment, the likes mm -hmm. I never want to live again. Mm -hmm. yes. And it was like the basketball parallel of what Kyler did out in the field yes. against Aaron Donald and company. It, so, it very much felt like that. Um, it was terrible. I'm not going to apologize for being a fan <laughs> because that's how, you, you know, I saw a lot of people dunking. They were dunking sure. on us. And look, that's fine. That's fine. You That's what being a fan is. Being a fan of a team, the whole spirit of this show is an unadulterated passion for a team, a player. It's what makes sports great. If you want me to be unbiased, sorry. I'm not going to be <laughs> unbiased. <not> <laughs> I am very biased for the teams that I like and the players that I like. That's what being a fan is. Yeah, I mean, especially for basketball where it's not, you know, the industry – you know that we live in but for dunking on i would just remind i would just remind people sure you respect the dead like that's not the time <laughs> right to dunk, and and they, and the sons were i mean they were six feet under they were man zombies that's not a loss that was not a loss that was a loss of life they were gone i whenever you're googling what's the largest comeback ever at halftime to figure out if you should stay in your chair us. And then deciding probably should leave. Mike, you went to the game. I was there. You witnessed a murder. Yes, I was now, there. the question I have for you is very simple. Mm -hmm. When did you leave? Mm. Uh, I was there with the boy. So we, oh my we soldiered through. <gasps> uh, enjoyed. Oh, no. Well, it was actually like. It was, you paid for that. I, I did. We paid a lot of money to go to that <laughs> game. Um, it, air quotes for the word game, of course. Right, right. Uh, but no, like actually being there was, I was able to, you know, work through some things so that by, by the end of the game, it was simply me laughing at the, my team being completely inept. And then the other team making every three pointer that they shot. You know how, uh, these are great opportunities, teaching moments for yes. us as parents to, you know, not overemphasize one thing and. You know, I, I'm just tired of having so many teaching moments as an Arizona yeah, sports Yeah, I've learned fan. enough. I mean, they have been taught every lesson about disappointment in the last two years. <laughs> uh, but Jason, you 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 were doing well. I, I the nice <laughs> thing is I gave up early, uh, so I was screaming at the TV early. But halftime came and I knew yes. it's over. It's I I didn't have one 
glimmer of hope. It was all gone. For the 30-point comeback. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I told I, – I think someone was saying, oh, I'm going to bet on the Suns at the halftime just to cover the sp spread. And I'm oh. like, it's only going to get worse. It is only going to get worse. And it did. Halftime. My Google was different than yours, Andy. Oh, okay. My Google was, what is the lowest points that anyone's ever scored in the playoffs? Yeah. And if I remember right, it was like the Utah Jazz had – 54 or something in a finals game oh, that would be anyways be what we did in the first half yeah um but yeah football okay football, football. it's way better uh we want to remind you because it is what, two weeks away two weeks away from the ultimate draft kit being released Oof. i wanted to highlight one of the many upgrades for the ultimate draft kit this year a fully rebuilt from the ground up cheat sheet creator um, it is so much more robust. It allows you to highlight uh, a variety of things, choose what you want to show, not show on the cheat sheet. A lot of people like myself, like bringing a physical cheat sheet to a draft, but now you can show what the sleepers, breakouts, busts, and values are, which will be in the UDK. You can hide the keepers. You can um, see what their rank was last year. There's a lot of different features now, including you know all the variables, age, those type of things. So that's just part of the uh, reworked and upgraded Ultimate Draft Kit. You can check that out right now at ultimatedraftkit.com. Make sure you get in there before June 1st. I know, I know, I know how this works. We've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> and I know that me saying that will mean very little because I know, I see the people scrambling at the end. Oh, May 31st is the day to get it. But if you get it now while I'm talking, you will get it at the lowest possible price, and you won't write in and say, oh, man, I just missed it. Can you give me my $5 back? And then, of course, I have to tell Papa Josh, slam that door shut. Mm -hmm. yeah. Slam it shut. Yeah. Right in their face. You had six months. <laughs> All right? That's a good amount of time. But no, ultimatedraftkit.com. Check that out. Quick question of the day. We have been – we've made our first pass each individually through every single player in the NFL for fantasy purposes, projecting their stat lines – and this show has always been, that's how we build out our rankings. That's how we build out everything for your draft is we go meticulously through each and every team. And sometimes by doing that, we are surprised. Stats that we didn't, players that we thought before we did the process, we wouldn't like, we love. Or players that we thought we were going to love end up much lower on our rankings. And so mm -hmm. today, now that we've all been through our initial uh, 2022 rankings, the question is, what's a player ranking that you discovered after statting these players out that completely surprised you? I, ahead, I had one that really made my jaw drop. Um, DK Metcalf is a superstar, unbelievable, young, talented wide receiver who uh, should be great and will be you know relevant for fantasy when i finished statting the seattle seahawks with drew lock and company dk metcalf was not in my top 24 and that was like whoa and i went back i looked at it i you know i i made sure that the numbers are something i believe in but the reality is i don't think drew lock is a good quarterback he has Noah Fant now and Tyler Lock and DK Metcalf. If you are splitting that pie in three major ways and the pie is rotten, um, mm, yeah. you don't want to eat it. And so that it was just one of those really You're saying Drew, Drew cooks a rotten pie. Drew left the pie out. He, oh. I mean, it was a should have been refrigerated. He knows better, but he got distracted very irresponsible. So, uh, but it's going to be a run first team. That's another huge part of it. And uh, I can't argue with it because he ended up in that place for me too. So, we, you know, it wasn't trying to bury him. It was trying to be realistic. So I, I'm that's a shocker. But, Mike, I don't know where you yeah, have Metcalf. I have him very low as well. Uh, All right. So what was one of the shocking discoveries from it, your first pass? It has to do with uh, the inverse of Seattle. They made a move. They traded away a franchise quarterback, a uh, I mean, Russ will probably make it into the Hall of Fame as long as he keeps playing the way that he has played. And Russell Wilson historically has, like, especially the last five years, has been incredible. He's been a quarterback one every year of his career except this last one because he tore a ligament in his hand and he came back too early. But along the way, while he's putting up huge fantasy numbers, he is also supporting two top 
top fantasy options, and he's got talent on this team with Cortland Sutton, Judy, and Tim Patrick. Now, uh, it's at this point, it's you know we're making the projection of who do I think becomes that the number one A of the of the group, and I'm going with Cortland Sutton, and he's just he's going to put up yards like Russell Wilson by the end of the year will be a 35 plus hundred yard guy and a 30 plus touchdown uh, thrower. And one of these guys is going to have an absolute monster season. I don't think that the Broncos weapons are uh, combined with Russell Wilson's skills are going to be, well, it's just going to be so split up that people will just be okay. It's, no, I think that we will have true superstardom from this wide receiver core and I've got it being Cortland Sutton, who is in my top 10 wide receivers uh, as of this moment with our rough draft from the stats. It's really not crazy. One of the things that we try to remember, or at least I try to remember after every season, we always have our things to remember. And it's, it's too obvious. I don't always talk about it, but I always say it to myself, is just how important the quarterback is to the wide receivers. Like, it's such a duh statement. Yeah. But it... It really is true, and so this switch of Russell Wilson affects these wide receivers tremendously. When you stat them out, you see how impactful it can be. And well, I do have Russ. I mean, I have Russ pretty high. I have him at seven. I have him at six. I was going to say, like, when Peyton Manning came over, uh, like immediately, and I'm not saying Russ is Peyton Manning, but their stats really are not all that different when you look at the, what they've been averaging. As soon as Manning came over, the, the Broncos had hot wide receivers. And why is that? Well, they were already good, but they just didn't have the quarterback play, and Peyton Manning solved that problem. How yeah, dare you, Tim I think, Tebow? <laughs> well, and I think that sure. the difference that I had on that wide receiver crew is I did spread it out more. Okay. Um, and I, I think the only thing that could go – I mean, this is the fifth year for Cortland Sutton. Sure. And so I think we've seen some kind of incredible play from him, and then we've seen some disappearing. We've dealt with injuries. And so it's more, I think um, – it's saying, hey, I believe he will be the one to step up. I mean, there's a lot of talk. Jerry Judy, uh, Tim Patrick, K.J. Hamler, Javante out of the backfield, Aguaybanam. So it, it's saying, hey, the target. I saw your target totals for Sutton, and they were much higher than, than I had for – I gave him – 150 you gave him. I gave him 26% of the tar of the attempts. That's not much off of what I have. I have him at 25%. So 130 targets, you have 150, Jason. I don't know where you had him. I have him at 22% 127 targets. I mean, so, back, yeah, that'll be. Back in 2019, Cortland Sutton had a line of 1,100 yards and six touchdowns, and he did that with Joe Flacco and company. It's not, yeah, it's not a question of whether or not he's capable. Like, it's a question of did you pick the right horse? Sure. Yeah, I, and that's why, like, it could be. Which, I mean, this could be one, like Jason said, that we just should have said. Well, duh. They yeah. extended him. They believe in him. I think both him He's and, the superior talent. Him and Judy are both going to have very strong years. So the the most shocking for me was where CeeDee Lamb ended up in my rankings because I think we've said it multiple times this offseason. There's this kind of, I think, earned trepidation that comes along with CeeDee Lamb. A lot of it was going into last year and maybe disappointing on people's expectations, right? He was supposed to be the Ridley of, of last year with the big leap forward. It didn't happen. 79 for 1,106. It's not awful. It's not incredible. It's not a Jefferson season, that's for sure. So I kind of thought, hey, I'm going to end up in that boat where CeeDee Lamb is a wide receiver too, and he's going to be up and down, and he ended up at six. Um, they and And that's with – you know, his target share going from 18.9% last year to 21.4% in this offense. Michael Gallup is not going to be ready. James Washington is not going to dominate targets. Uh, Jalen Tolbert could be somebody we're sleeping on in this offense. But CeeDee Lamb ended up in a position where, look, we know what the offense is going to do. We know what Dak's capable of. And he ended up at sixth. So the opportunities in front of him, the passing volume, I mean, they threw the ball 643 times last year. And you're losing Amari Cooper out of this offense and Michael Gallup for a portion of the year. So sheer volume and dependency on CeeDee Lamb put him much higher than I expected him to be. So um, that was a bit of a shocker to me. There are a number of players that, you know, when these go live, and you'll see them soon on the website, and you'll see them in detail in the Ultimate Draft Kit, I think you'll be 
Well, we'll hear from you. Let's put it that way. Sure. It'll be interesting. Um, any other things to cover in the quick question there? Any other things you wanted to mention? I think those were good little teas. Those were those were a good little tease. Those is that is that said right? Is that tease is? Those were that was a good little tease. There you go. <laughs> News and notes from around the league. Some real grammar police going on over there. Yeah, I felt bad about it. I should have <laughs> just moved on. Um, the, pe- the people are happy it's for our show. Yeah, yeah, but that was good. All right, Jarvis Landry signed a one-year deal with the Saints, base salary of $3 million. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know what to make of the deal. I did see him go off the board instantaneously in all of the uh, drafts that were in the middle of being, you know, slow drafts happening. He went off the board in my dynasty startup like that moment that sure. they happened. He, he's not. He's not on the upward trajectory as a player. He's on the Emmanuel Sanders plan. Um, which could be okay. I mean, Emmanuel Sanders had moments in San Francisco. He had a couple moments in New Orleans. He had moments, moments in, in Buffalo. In Buffalo. So can Jarvis have moments? Yes. Would I have more confidence in them if Drew Brees was the quarterback? Yeah. Or Josh Allen? Yeah. So I think that they – I mean, this Saints offense gets Michael Thomas, Jarvis Landry, and Chris, Chris Olave, Olave. – they're very interesting. Added to them. So what will they do is kind of my question. I'm very curious about the prescription for Jameis Winston last year was not the same one that we saw in in Tampa Bay. It was basically he was a 14 to 3 touchdown to interception ratio. He wasn't throwing the ball a whole lot. So Will that continue, or now that he has weapons, will they entrust him, or will the defense be good enough to where you don't have to, right? You're not just going to tell Jameis, go throw the ball like crazy and turn the ball over and and bring your team down like you did in Tampa if you don't have to, but maybe they can compete now if they're challenged by a big offense. Yeah, that's. I think that's the exact right way to look at it. They're going to contain Jameis and, and try to mitigate his turnover prone nature which you saw in a small sample last year but I mean goodness gracious last year you're throwing to Marquez Callaway and Traquan Smith and uh, Deontay Harris and now it's you have legit wide receivers so should they run up against you know Tampa Bay in division and they need to air it out they'll be able to I Jameis was another one that I was surprised at he was a lot higher for me than I thought he would See, be he was lower than oh. I thought he because I I love these weapons and yeah. I you know, I'm, I'm always a sucker for James Winston. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I'm still a believer, but uh, yeah, he was he was down. He's my quarterback twenty right now. All right, the uh, Jerry Judy news that broke this past week, and I think it broke at the end of the Footcast on Thursday. Um, what is the latest here? He's, he was held at uh, where at a county jail, yeah, <laughs> of which yeah, a name nice. I can't pronounce. Um, Second degree criminal tampering. He was released, I believe, uh, on bond and has a court date on May 31st. Do we have any update on the implications? Things yeah. that were being reported were very, I, they the, sounded minor. The only thing that I would say is is an update that we know now because something could still come from this. But what we do know is it is not a domestic you, 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 you really worried when he was arrested and you heard the word domestic in there that there would be a a, a real violent long, component a, a real bad violent component that could you know destroy a career um this isn't that so it's tbd on uh what would happen i'm you know if i had to guess right now uh, i would i would guess that n- nothing comes of this i think that the judge that let him go uh, said there wasn't much to it, so I I doubt that he gets suspended. He was, but there's always a potential. It was reported he locked his child, his child's mother's wallet and baby formula in a car because she took his phone. Yeah, it was some kind and of then, fight. But he Jerry Judy did return to to off season workouts today, the, or yesterday. The, the Falcons reporting. managed. Yeah, baby, they managed to <laughs> pry yeah. the invaluable Brian Edwards away from the Raiders. Oh, Raiders, you've been fooled. And uh, Atlanta receives Edwards and a seventh, and the Raiders receive oh, a, baby. a fifth. 
Oh, baby. I, I mean, it makes so much sense for the Raiders because you don't need two Devontae Adams, right, Mike? Right. So you can catch yes, it for, on one like, of them. Derek Carr just kept saying Edwards is very similar to Adams, and that would just it would not gel. So good work by the Raiders getting rid of the distraction because you didn't want too many one, mouths to feed. Too many Adams type players. Right. Derek so Carr you're can in, only throw one ball. You're in when Mar Mariota and the Mariota Edwards is kind of your thing. It's a couple of my guys for this year, maybe. It's just delicious garbage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Falcons also signed Geron Geronimo Allison. They're trying to keep up with the Bears, I believe, on signing. Oh no, washed up the Bears. Wideouts. The Bears also won up them because they signed a one-year deal with Tajay Sharp. He's still yes. playing, huh? Yes. From wasn't he on the Falcons last year? Yes, they swap. They swap. <laughs> Who else did the? Oh, Dante what? Pettis. The bear. How do you not have this in there? The Bears brought in Dante Pettis, what guys. Is, yeah. Oh man, that's <laughs> this is the the Bears and the Falcons are just competing for the worst trash rosters. I love it. The is Bears this, win. Is this the thing where like, if you could, you'd go to a nice steak restaurant, but if you can't, you get steak from a buffet like in mass quantities, like low quality meat. But lots of it. Yeah, I can't have an eight ounce filet mignon, so I'm gonna have thirty two ounces yeah. right. of some skirt steak. <laughs> this is when they they just they uh, when they get the number one and two picks in the NFL draft, they're gonna point. We were really trying. Look at all the signings that we had over the off season. And the Bears fans, they think that I'm picking on them, but listen, you're the team that signed Dante Pettis, not me. <laughs> it wasn't me. Uh Keelan Cole one year deal with the Raiders. So well, they they had to replace Brian Edwards. Yeah, yeah. So I think they have Matt Collins now too, who always what? seems to, tight end Matt Collins. Yeah, tight end wide receiver who's like fifteen point six a reception, um, and always makes plays. Like last year, in Miami would just make a play here or there. He's the Mo Alley Cox of wide receivers. There you go. Sure. There you okay. go. He does get bigger by the year. It's unbelievable, man. The guy <laughs> He's just scaled keeps, up. You just it's exactly right. He's not getting taller or fatter. He's just perfectly scaling up. Yeah, it's just, I don't know how he does that. It's, I, I wish I could do it. I only go out. <laughs> <laughs> I need I was, to add the height. I had a laundry list of what joke to go with there, and thankfully you fell. I didn't have sword. a single one. Thank but that's you. T, you're off your game. <laughs> <laughs> He's lying. I know. All right, uh, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to dive into some mailbag. All right, uh, boy, do you like that comparison, skirt steak there, uh, Kyle, for your wide receiver core in Atlanta? Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, – looking forward to the season? We play the Chargers one week. That's, yeah. That's going to be fun. Oh, you're looking – you're at the point where you're looking at the opponent's games. Like, who who are you playing? The Cardinals. Uh, Cardinals are starting against uh, Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, going to go well. <laughs> I'm starting <laughs> 0 one at home. I mean, wouldn't you rather play – like that to me, I, I was actually happy because I knew we were playing the Chiefs this year. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'd rather play without Hopkins. No, 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 no. But I'd rather play Mahomes the first game without Tyreek mm. and with these new wide receiver weapons. Like, if you have to pick a time, I'd rather lose close. Is what I'm saying. Like a closer game. Sure, makes sense. All right, into the mailbag we go. Mailbag. Mailbag. <laughs> <laughs> all right if you have a question for the podcast you can go to the website thefantasyfootballers.com click the submit a question button or you can dial our voicemail hotline the number is 302-464-TFFB looks like we got a voicemail we'll kick it off with how's it going guys love the show thank you for everything you do quick question for redraft do we want travis kelsey Mark Andrews as the first tight end off the board. Yeah, I mean, I love this question because now that we're done with our rankings, I I was wanting to ask you two gentlemen. I've not sure. dug through yours. I'm curious who is your number one. It's, Mark Andrews is number one for me. Ooh, he is for me as well. It, it's still Travis Kelsey for me. Um, diving into those, you know, the the numbers on Mark Andrews, I do think that like things will be changing here for Baltimore. They I think they want to at least try to be a little bit more balanced in, in terms of passing to running, not just completely be a run dominant team, but like thing, it just skewed too far for me last year where if he, remembering back 
somehow the Baltimore Ravens defense, I mean, they had a bunch of injuries and things, but they just, they were not normal Ravens uh, defense of shutting people down. So they had to, you know, get into these firefights. So I took that into account and kind of lowered the, the volume for him. Meanwhile, Travis Kelsey, like with no Tyreek Hill and uh, Valdez Scantling as the presumed number one wide receiver, like, I think that the targets, not only are they safe for Kelsey, they probably have to go up at least a, a, a hair or two. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind, obviously, either player. I don't have, like, a strong, you made a wrong choice if you choose one over the other. Uh, last year, you know, Kelsey had 92 receptions. He had 1,100 yards. He still ended up, I think, behind Mark Andrews by a good he, 40 points or yeah, something. Yeah, he did. Andrews finished as the tight end one, and I think that the gap this is, year in ADP, I think Travis Kelsey will still be the first one drafted, which means Mark Andrews should be the better value if he's dropping into the second round. I would much prefer to have Mark Andrews, you know, in the, uh, you know, the the opening of the second than Kelsey at the end of the first. All right, YouTube question from uh, Tucker Yarborough says, "What is your guys' current temperature on Allen Robinson?" Allen Robinson's twenty eight years old, signed a three year deal with the Rams. They uh, Odell has no home. I don't know if he's going back there. Uh, I guess I have less confidence that he is now than I did earlier in the off season. But um, I am curious where Allen Robinson ended up in your guys' rankings. For me, he was 35, 35. I think Ooh. he will have some games, but, uh, you know, I got him for 90 receptions for 936 yards. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's really tough for me. He's probably the hardest player to evaluate because he is not old. He is not past the age where he should have lost it. But nothing on film or analytically last year was even remotely redeemable. He was putridly bad. He was so bad that, I mean, you know, he you couldn't have been much worse than Allen Robinson last year. He, he took home the, the footy for the poopiest pants. Yeah, he had 38 receptions for 410 yards, one touchdown, never looked good, wasn't getting separation. So you have to ask yourself, like, was he just straight up dogging it because he didn't care? He was playing on the franchise tag, doesn't want to get injured, wants to get that next contract, get out of town. If he was doing that, then he should be good this year. Or has he just lost it? And Because if that's who he is, I know it's going to be better for him going to the Rams, uh, having Matthew Stafford, and it will be better. But he'll never get back to being great. So I've got him about where you have him. I don't expect big things from Allen Robinson. I still think Cooper Cup is going to dominate uh, – the, the targets, the receptions, the yards, and then Allen Robinson will have his games, you know, mixed in with Van Jefferson. And I think he'll get some volume. I mean, you got no Robert Woods there in the offense anymore, and if they don't bring back OBJ, I think volume may head his way. He's sure-handed, generally. Sure. The Allen Robinson, at this point for me, is I have him lower than you guys, but probably a little bit too low right now looking at it. But ADP will dictate everything for me on Robinson. Like, I'm not – excited to go I'm not excited to draft him I'm not excited to move past him but if like the value presents itself I, he's a high variance player like Jason laid out like he could be great or he could have poopy pants again he's 28 years old do you have Van Jefferson above him I do okay yeah I do, I, I do not I don't either but I don't I could see that happening I mean those two guys to me are are 2a and 2b in either order. I do think there is a world where at the end of the season we say, man, we should have seen this coming. Allen Robinson has always been so great. He's not too old, and he was put with McVay and Stafford, and he dominates this year. But if he does, if he dominates, can you imagine how just angry yes. Bears fans would be? Because then you know if he dominates, you know he was just yeah. straight up dogging it on the and field. I, you know, I think you have to step back and say, Sean McVay and this, you know, management chose Allen Robinson. Sure. To go pay this money to on a three year deal and say, they are saying that they still believe. So, from a talent evaluation, kicking the picks away, you know, bringing in the veteran type of player, they at least made the decision that they believed, which, which does at least put him into that sleeper category for me. A little bit. I think they're also, you know, 
a, they're a, kind of backed into that decision that they never have draft picks because they always trade them in the middle of the season. And there were no veterans. free agents. And the free agent wide receivers this year were not the cream of the crop. So I don't blame them at all for going for Robinson, but I think that their hand was forced a little bit. Okay, that makes some sense. Uh, let's uh, hit another voicemail here. Hey, guys. Keeper League question here, half point PPR. Would you keep Eckler or Chase? Thanks, guys. Mm. Oh, man, just straight up? Mm-hmm. It, this is funny. I, I saw a note on this, Eckler versus Chase. Eckler is my running back three. Chase. Three? Yeah, Chase is my wide receiver three. So it's who would you rather have, the running back three or the wide receiver three? I would go with the running back three. But I didn't realize until listening to the voicemail, this is a keeper question. And when it's that close, because, you know, you could argue you, that, that Chase as the wide receiver three could be more valuable than a running back who's probably going to get injured and miss a few games uh, and his value decreases as the season goes along. In a keeper league, I, I would I would go with Chase. I would rather have the super young dominant. I mean, I don't I don't care about keepers I don't view them like the dynasty I don't get up in arms about age or how much longer I can keep them usually those things don't matter but in a situation where this is I think a fair tiebreaker yeah I don't mind that I mean the logic makes sense and um Eckler has an injury history and getting banged up and there I think they want I don't think they want as much on Eckler's back as they have that, that's on it right now and it could it's mean, a really big muscular back though yes I mean, yes. that dude is Swole. Yeah, I mean he's he's been great. He will probably be great again. It's kind of like the well, they don't want to give Christian McCaffrey all right. that work, and then he does. But um, yeah, the the I think I side with Jason in that it's if Austin if both of these players hit, then Eckler is probably the one who's more valuable. But looking at the probability of who is safer, like. It, shouldn't just completely bust aside from a you know a wild injury it would be chase so i think i might take the safety of the wide receiver jonathan from twitter wants to know who's won the most championships since the podcast started individual wins only uh that must be a is it andy i mean if, if uh, no, we're, jason's had if a we're talking we both, oh, yeah, had, both had, had we both won two dynasties if you're combining the dynasty league with our league of record then it's one of you two if we include the listener league then it's me Yes. Because I've got two yes. listener league, two dynasty, and the league of record. Andy's got two dynasty. You've won our league of record the most, so we kind of right. all have different ways we can dunk on the others. I was curious how that answer was going to go. Instagram question from Harrison <laughs> Mike 84 uh, Thoughts on drafting Miami running backs with more touchdown opportunities? Oh, dude. Miami Ooh. was not an easy team. I love this. To stat. Oh, then I'm going to throw to you. I love this question because I am. Oh, U T. Oh. I am out. See you later. I'm not drafting a Miami running back. That's that's my stance. Interesting. I definitely think that there will be value here. I think that there as a group, if you could draft the Miami running backs and you know you're drafting a team, I think you're gonna be fine. But I have no idea how many games Raheem Morris will be able to <laughs> Raheem, <laughs> Raheem, <laughs> Raheem uh, Mostert will be able to play. Football, it's football. Uh, I I don't know how many games he's going to be able to play. I do think he's going to run ahead of Chase Edmonds, who will be more of the pass catching back. I personally think Sony Michelle will be involved, and I I don't want to make the Russian roulette. It's kind of like Patriots backfields of old, or even last year where Mike Daniel coached the San Francisco 49ers. So much value from that running game, but as someone who literally had all of those running backs. I could choose whoever I wanted to start every week. It did not go well. It was not a process that I enjoyed, and this just this – Did he say Mike Daniel again? He did. That's the second time in a row. Hmm. My, my apologies. Can you put the Mick back in this man's name? Mike, Mike McDaniel. We got Mike Daniel and Raheem Morris. <laughs> Dude, we I were in the sun for a long and, time. And you, you were making such a good point, and I get it. I, I do not have a fear of Chase Edmonds. Now, I do not have – like we, do you, do, we, when, Did you project him to be the lead rusher? I projected him with the most total rushing attempts, yes. Okay, I did too, and um, Jason has that Which makes flipped. it – Chase Edmonds last year, people that weren't from Arizona went into the season with an expectation that he may make a leap. 
But I think we know what Chase Edmonds is, which is a, a stellar pass catcher, Yes, which gives him a floor. Like, he will have the PPR floor, and I think he will get enough work, like 150, 160 carries of work, to where I think, look, this is a running back, too. Now, if you go into the season and you want to find the, you know, a top 10 guy here, you, yeah, the, the, the entire committee might be a top 10 backfield with Mike McDaniel, but... Mike Daniel. <laughs> Ike. It's Ike Daniel. Oh, Ike man. Daniel. Um, please leave the M's <laughs> off of this. But I do. Have, I have Edmonds at twenty five. I don't know where you have him, Mike. Um, I have him just just slightly lower than that. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I look. Fantasy is also about the process that you want to go through, and I've been there. I've been there with the Forty ers I've been there with the Seahawks backfield, where I've had two, which meant I had none. You know, you get two of the guys in the backfield, and you don't know which one to rotate through, and you always pick the wrong one, and it's not any fun. Raheem Mostert. In his career, Morris. Thank you. Oh my gosh! Yes. Look, in the past two mute years, mute this guy's mic. In the past two years combined, he's appeared in nine games. In 2019, he he saw 34 percent of the snaps in 16 games, so he played the whole season. But that is it. Other than that, like he hasn't made it through 10 games. Chase Edmonds was pretty good on a per game basis last yes. year. Yes, not you know. He was 164 carries, 837 yards rushing, 60 receptions, 440 receivers. And it was it was immediate. Like they were Chase Edmonds was one of the first contracts uh announced during the legal tampering period. So they they went after him. I fully expect like if if I were to draft one, Chase Edmonds will score the most fantasy points. I have him as the leader of the backfield of fantasy points this season. Uh, I think he's safer to make it through the season, even though he's a smaller back just because of the injury history with the other guys. Um, so if I were to go in on one of these guys, it it would be Chase. I won't, but it would be Chase. All right, this question from Instagram. Logan has a question. Dynasty trade. Amon Ra St. Brown plus the 111 Ooh. for Joseph Mixon. Oh. So Amon someone... Ra is 22 years old. He actually was a player that surprised in my rankings in that he was higher than I expected him to be. Okay. Um, I have him at 18. Ooh, that's spicy. spicy. I've got him at 33. Um, obviously dominated down down the stretch, but from a passing volume standpoint in that offense, I think you're going to see almost 600 attempts. Uh, kind of the you know last year I have I have Jared Goff throwing for over four thousand yards so yeah um Amon Ra is going to soak up a lot of that I think he proved enough over those games not to where you get out of control with him but sure. but eighteen feels alright so the one eleven if we're gonna put a name or a couple of names yeah, let's to it would be someone like George Pickens Jahan Dotson maybe Kenny Pickett or uh, maybe James Cook falls there I don't think you can rely on James Cook just because. There's so few running backs in most leagues. When you get to the draft, they they overdraft the running backs. Um, but if this you is, were to grab one of those guys with Amon Ross St. Brown, this is I Mixon. Th I would take the Mixon. Yeah, side. I would take Joe Mixon. Yeah, this is Mixon's one of the. It's always interesting in startup dynasties where the running backs go, and Mixon is so young and attached to such a good situation that. I'm willing to take a little bit of a leap on him to sure. last a few years. There's a great debate going on right now in fantasy circles on running back age, running back contract. Or whether it's Raheem Mostert <laughs> or Raheem Morris. Right. And I just want to weigh in here on uh, Morris. Um, but there's this great debate because it used to be this 30-year-old age cliff, 28-year-old age cliff. And now if you if you look at the last several years, I mean, you're talking about no running backs, so few running backs mattering after like 26. These great run, Todd Gurley, Devonta Freeman, these number guys who finish as the number one David running back. David Johnson. David Johnson, right? And then they all just poof, disappear. So is it that's the new normal and the NFL is just going to throw away running backs or the other camp, and I find myself a little bit more here, is that there was not a bunch of great running backs for a large series of years and then 2017 came around and you had a great class of running backs right um you know you this is where 
you had the influx of Zeke and Kamara and Mixon and just a bunch of like we knew that that you know it was just a great class and I think those guys play a little longer than than what we've seen earlier so someone like Joe Mixon who you know he's got a dead cap of eight and a half million this year five and a half million he's he's under contract for three more years I think he plays well with Joe Mick with uh, Joe Burrow for two or three Zeke, more years if Zeke falls off this year he will add to that list Yes. Because he's 26. And that will be Gurley and David Johnson and Zeke and all of those players. Um, but Mixon does seem set up. Seems all right. Uh, Instagram question from Tombo. Wants a quick go over of our League of Record Keeper rules once again. Sure. Which we can do. So uh, we are a, th when it comes down to it, we are a three keeper league. And the way it functions is end of season, those rosters are now locked. You pick the one player. And you say that this is my franchise player. This is a player that I know for sure I will get, and they are fully locked in. So let's we'll just say Dalvin Cook is my franchise player. Now I will select three more players, and they will go into a lottery, uh, which we you know we go through. We have a, like a fun event every single year, and we find out who's going back into the draft and which two players are going to be kept along with the franchise player, with the caveat of. The three lotto players, their position cannot match the franchise player. They can all be the same in the lottery, but not match the franchise so if, player. If Dalvin Cook was your franchise, then you have to in your lottery, the other three players have to be wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends. Yeah. Yeah, and, that's exactly right. And it's great because sometimes a team will have two awesome running backs. You know, you've got yes. you've got Jonathan Taylor and Dalvin Cook. And you want to risk getting both of them, so you franchise a wide receiver, and then put those guys into the lottery, and then you hold your breath, yes, because you don't want to lose a great tier one guy like that. I just saw one of the listeners of the show just had their keeper lottery, which was pretty exciting. They were sharing that with us. Um, in our league, I had that situation. I had Diggs as a franchise, and then you had Cook, Acres, Kyle Pitts, Wrist Cook. To try to get two running backs, ended up losing acres. But that's how it functions. It's been really fun because it adds yes. another event to the yearly calendar, which that's all we want as fantasy players. That is correct. Phil in Arkansas, what's the origin story for Jeremy and Brooks's nicknames? Mm. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll go with uh, Jeremy's because that is easy on my mind right now. <laughs> and Andy should uh, bring in the Giamatti <laughs> side. Uh, but... Uh, so Jeremy is like a Mr. Fix-It around the office, you know, a real manly man. Uh, if the toilet needs fixing, we're, we're definitely going to Jeremy. If a bug right? needs killing. Oh, it's Jeremy. it's Jeremy. And when we first started the Spitballers, the first recording, and he's like the primary producer there, um, he was wearing this red flannel, you know. He's wearing the buffalo, buffalo plaid. Yeah, buffalo plaid. I think you might have had a tool belt on. <laughs> um, and so we called him Al Borland from – the uh, great hit sitcom from the <laughs> yes, 90s. of course. <laughs> um, home Improvement. Home Improvement. Uh, so he was Al Borland, and then as we kept referring to him, one day someone... I, they, was, someone on the... Sh you, you, it was you, Andy. Oh, it was me? Yeah, you were you threw to me, and it so sounded like you said Owl Borland, and it... And it stuck. stuck. It stuck, so now you're a bird. And Mike, why don't you handle the judge? So <laughs> the, the judge, that was uh, on our weekly bonus episode of... Uh, for join the foot supporters called the Footcast, we were asked to cast our movie of the fantasy footballers the movie, and I Andy was I don't know if he had something for lunch. She was, was feeling a little spicy, and so for so, good. so for Brooks, he just threw out that he should be played by Paul Giamatti. Um, and Jason's got his phone out. I don't, I'm just taking I don't know a what picture of behind these guys. We have the worst okay. picture. Of yeah. So, uh, Andy, I believe in a matter that was trying to be more insulting, uh, it just said, no, we'll have, we'll have Paul Giamatti be you in the movie. And then eventually he just got worked into the fantasy court where he became the judge. And then he had to be judge Giamatti. We actually, we surprised him with that drop. Like with the, the the fantasy court, yeah, drop? fantasy court dun, with dun, Judge dun, Giamatti. Dun. He had no idea it was going to say with Judge Giamatti. We have trolled him with it since the beginning. I mean, yes. there is a 
There is a very large poster of Paul Giamatti behind him. It's the worst picture that's ever been taken of any human. Yeah, it's like a mugshot. Um, and it's not good. So, and he's leaned in. I mean, Brooks has leaned in to Judge Giamatti, and now he he answers a lot of things on Slack with Judge Giamatti or yes. <laughs> Paul Giamatti gifts. And- yes, there's an unlimited amount of Paul Giamatti <laughs> gifts for every occasion. Yeah. So. and I will post the the photo I just took from my perspective on the set of uh, the judge under the judging look mm. of Mr. Giamatti. Yeah, which reminds me, Richard Karn, if you're listening, step up your gift game. There's not a lot out there. Oh, oh you've been trying to really hit the Al Borland <laughs> gifts, huh? I've I been trying. <laughs> when, gifts when, weren't around in that day. Here's here, here's what went through my mind. What does season one's winner of Survivor have to do with anything? Oh, Richard Hatch. Yeah, because I sure Richard. I don't know the guy. That guy has a real name. Richard Al Borland. Karn, yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, he he used to host Family Feud poorly. Pretty, pretty sure his name is Al Borland. <laughs> Pretty sure I'll look see, that up, but see. I'm pretty sure his birth certificate says Al Borland. Oh, he was he was not good on Family Feud. That was I mean, not his calling. No, <laughs> no, they've they, they've gone through a few. Steve Harvey's great. Steve though. Harvey's yes. so good. He's very good. All right, I guess that's it for today's episode. Twitter at the FF Ballers, UltimateDraftKit.com, and the community is JoinTheFoot.com. We will be back with another episode for you Thursday. Thanks for tuning in, supporting the show. We love you, and we'll talk to you soon. Stay safe, everybody. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.